With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hi everyone, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. I'm your host for Yoga Birth Babies. And today we have Kiyuki Smith, and she and I are speaking about the birthing from within methodology. So I just did a whole weekend called Crossing the Threshold. It was a birthing from within. Uh, I think they call it an intensive or initiative into, I'll be doing some birthing from within mentor work. So I'm very excited about that program. And after my weekend with Kuki, I wanted to talk more. I wanted her to explain some of these amazing methods and, and the philosophy and theology behind it. So that is what this podcast is about. I really enjoyed speaking with her. I think there are some pieces of this methodology that I think everyone, no matter what type of birth you're planning on having, medicated, unmedicated, vaginal cesarean, uh, can really take pieces of and use to see through that situation of birth. It was a wonderful conversation, so I hope you enjoy that. Before we get to that talk, I just want to share a little blurb that one of my past teacher trainees shared with me. So Julie wrote this, and I, I just got excited when I hear the feedback. It's something I put my heart and soul into this teacher training. Caprice and I have been leading it for several years. And when I see that people come out of on the other side, feeling empowered and enriched by the experience, I feel truly touched. And I don't know what else to say, but okay, let me read to you what she wrote. As a midwife, I found this training to be comprehensive and informative with regard to the pregnant body, labor, and birth. It was the perfect combination of intense didactic learning and yoga teacher training. I love the online component, the required reading, the comprehensive exam required to gain the certification, the whole training. Deb and Caprice have created the most comprehensive evidence-based pelvic sound prenatal yoga teacher training out there. At completion, I felt prepared to teach and confident that I could keep my pregnant students safe and prepared for an active labor. So thank you, Julie, for sharing that because it means a lot to me. So we have five 85-hour teacher trainings coming up. The fall one, we actually released the online component in August. So that's coming up soon. So that's in New York City. And then we'll be in... Charlotte, North Carolina in November and December, over to a new studio, Willow Street in Washington, D.C., January and February, back in New York for March and April, and then heading back to Richmond, Virginia. I have to say, I loved being in Richmond. It was a beautiful part, carry down. It was wonderful at Yoga Source. That is April and May. So I am beyond thrilled at these upcoming teacher trainings. So check it out. You can check out on our website, prenatalyogacenter.com about that. And then something else I just wanted to give a little shout out to is I just finished uh, Who's Afraid of the Pregnant Yogi? That is for yoga teachers who may feel a little uncomfortable when a pregnant student saunters in. So I am I just finished it. I'm packaging it nicely. Ursula is working hard to edit it and we'll be I'll be releasing that soon so that you can buy that self-guided online course. All right. That is enough of me chatting. I hope you enjoyed this really fantastic conversation with Kiyuki Smith and enjoy. We'll take a quick break and we'll come back. We'll be speaking with Kiyuki. This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Calendar. Let's be real. Running a household can be exhausting and chaotic and finding the perfect Mother's Day gift it's not exactly a no-brainer. Until now. 
The Skylight Calendar is the best way to organize the family and give everyone, especially mom, some peace of mind to enjoy the things that matter most. The Skylight Calendar is a smart, touchscreen calendar that keeps track of and manages the chores, dinner planning, groceries, and to-dos for the whole family. The Skylight Calendar automatically syncs each family member's digital calendars and displays them all together on one color-coded touchscreen. It even doubles as a digital picture frame, so you can finally share all those special moments that are just sitting on your phone. As a limited time offer for our listeners, get 15% off your purchase of a Skylight calendar when you go to skylightcal.com slash easy. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-C-A-L dot com slash easy. Get 15% off your Mother's Day purchase now at skylightcal.com slash easy. Hi, Kayuki. How are you today? I'm good, Deb. Thank you. I'm so excited to speak with you. So just giving a little bit of background for listeners, I just spent a whole weekend with Kayuki and Nikki studying the birthing from within methodology. It was a big chunk of Friday night, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. And wow, did we get immersed and go deep. So it just, it, all this information was percolating. I mean, I just was so excited to have a chance to talk to you about it. So yay, here we go. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. It, you, like you said, it's a really deep weekend. So it's really, um, it's really awesome to be able to have just this tiny chance to, to debrief because not everybody has that chance. That's great. Yeah. And to be honest, I didn't really know what I was getting into. Um, in fact, yeah, nobody this- does when they come to this weekend. <laughs> well, I mean, like I really didn't, it wasn't until, see, we ended it on Sunday and I think it was like maybe three o'clock that um, Lindsay's like, so you're going to do the whole thing. I'm like, what? There's more after this weekend. I didn't even realize I signed up for like a whole online month long course. I had no idea. I thought it was like, okay, I'm just doing this whole weekend. (laughs) I I didn't know. (laughs) Some people don't do that follow up four week thing. If they feel like they got what they wanted. Oh no, no, I'm going, I'm doing it. (laughs) A lot of people think, wow, because the weekend is so much focused on the birth worker themselves. Mm -hmm. And then the little four week unit is about how we might sort of externalize that practice to work with our clients. So most people do do it, but some people don't. (laughs) Yeah. I really want to take this and start to add it. And what was interesting was I didn't, and maybe it's because I had read Birthing Within and it is part of our teacher trained curriculum. And I have interviewed Pam England. I actually have pulled pieces and I didn't even realize it into the way, into my teacher training and the way I already teach. So Mm -hmm. the idea of taking this even deeper is really exciting to me. So I'm, I'm thrilled. All right. So let's jump into, if you can just tell everyone a little bit about yourself and how you got into the birthing world. Yeah, of course. So I am based here in New York city, just like you are. And I got into the birthing world, um, like a lot of birth workers, uh, when I got pregnant myself. Um, and when I got pregnant, I realized that I didn't know anything about birth or I felt like I didn't know anything about birth. Mm -hmm. And it was such a weird experience for me because I knew so much about so many other things. (laughs) It's really well educated and you know, I just, I was 29. I felt like, you know, if somebody brought up a topic like, you know, at a cocktail party, I could get on that topic and speak intelligently about it. But it turned out not birth, which is like one of the most important topics because we're all born. Yeah. Everybody gets, that's how everybody starts in the world. And this one thing that everybody, literally everybody alive in the world has done, I didn't really know anything about. So I got, I dove really deep right away in pregnancy. And at the time I was a public school teacher, I'd been doing it for several years and I was kind of ready for a change. And so after I had my baby, you know, I was taking time off. I went to a doula training and, uh, that was like the, the beginning of the, (laughs) um, and I transitioned to birth work first as a birth doula. Then I started doing a lot of work in baby wearing, which I still do a little bit of. And then as a, um, Lamaze childbirth educator, and then I, I had already read the book Birthing from Within, like so many pregnant people do, but I came to Birthing from Within as a professional. Finally, I showed up at my first workshop in 2014. And then you just drank the Kool-Aid and jumped in. And you're also on the board of directors. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm on the board of directors. And as you know, uh, I'm a, one, a facilitator now, which mm-hmm, means mm-hmm. the sort of arm of Birthing from Within that trains professionals 
Yeah, and I'm on the board of directors, and I um, I also edit the blog. So you're very busy in that world. I am. I am. It happened pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, it's a good world. So if you wouldn't mind just telling people, that a lot of people have heard, probably heard the book. It's been, you know, it's that yeah. like the anime book. Like a lot of these are just kind of in the hemisphere of birth. Like people get pregnant and everyone's like, here, read these. So can you, t- for those that haven't or haven't actually picked it up to read it, can you talk a little bit about the background of birthing from within? Yeah, it's it's actually really interesting. Um, so Pam England um, lives in uh, the Southwest. She was a midwife um, in the 80s. And um, she became a midwife before having her first baby. And when she had her first baby, something happened to her that happens. This is not infrequent, actually, among birth workers, which is that she had a um, traumatic birth. And it was a shock, obviously. I mean, it's a little same version of what I was just talking about when I got pregnant to suddenly realize that you don't know anything. But if you're a midwife, you have an expectation of knowing something. And right? a context, like you've seen it, you've watched no. others, you've been involved. About it. And so it was a real shock and it got her to thinking, what's going on um, inside me, but also inside our culture that... I was so ill-prepared for this relatively common experience. She did have a cesarean, but it wasn't under enormously uncommon circumstances. You know, it was relatively common. Her birth wasn't outlyingly emergent or anything like that. You know, how was I not prepared? What's going on in our culture that people are not prepared for this? What's going on in myself that I'm not prepared? And that was the seed of birthing from within. And she started working with parents um, you know, doing childbirth ed classes with these questions in mind. And she wrote the book, I think it was published in the late nineties. Um, and the program grew from there. Um, and, um, very recently within the last about year and a half, um, we've changed our training model, um, for people who want to go into birthing from within and, and we're pulling in a lot more people. Now we're doing more trainings for professionals, um, so that parents have, there are more people that parents can work with. Um, and that's part of what you witnessed last weekend is one of our new trainings that we're take sort of been taking on the road within the last year or so. How is that different than what you were doing before? So, um, the, uh, there are a lot of things that are very similar. The underlying philosophy is similar. Um, but, um, the, one of the big differences that this first training that, that you attended, Deb, um, called crossing the threshold, it's, we don't even really call it a training. We call it a live retreat, um, because it's really focused on direct experience. So at this initial retreat at professionals first encounter with birthing from within, we want to make sure that they have a direct internal experience with birthing from within instead of the stance being like, here's how you teach birthing from within. We do birthing from within with Mm -hmm. you rather than thinking directly about your clients and how you're going to teach them a class or give them doula work that's like BFW themed. Instead of that, we show you how to do the work in your own self. And then slowly we move into how you might extend it into client work. I like that. And I also appreciated that. I appreciated kind of rolling in the mud of it and then seeing being aware of how deep it can go, being aware of the different reactions one can have so that when you are working with parents, it doesn't feel so blind. It doesn't feel so hierarchy. Like I've been there. I've, you know, I've, I understand that we can go deep or I understand maybe there's resistance. So I like that approach that you guys used. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been a really amazing process and it, opens it up also to all kinds of people. I'm sure that you can imagine this broad spectrum of people who would benefit or who would enjoy that crossing the threshold experience. It's not just childbirth educators and doulas by a long Mm -hmm. shot. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a really amazing experience. I had a great time with it. So talk a little bit about how birthing from within differs from other approaches of childbirth ed. Yeah. Um, that's really the key question, isn't it? (laughs) Um, so Many, um, I'm going to go ahead and say most, maybe even all, um, systems or approaches, you know, branded systems of childbirth education, um, 
often sort of work with what you might call like a recipe, like an unconscious recipe. Some approaches to childbirth ed have very overt recipes where they say, you do these things and you'll get a good birth. Well, we all know that is an empty promise. Yeah, well, it's what, what do we know, right? So I can't say that with any certainty because who knows what the heck is going to happen. Well, that's it. Like you can't promise anyone anything because we don't know how the birth. So I think that's setting people up for some disappointment. It can. Yeah. And so it absolutely can. You're absolutely right. Um, so some childbirth ed approaches actually are really explicit about that right? This is what you should do and things will go well. Others are, are less explicit. Um, and there are definitely approaches to childbirth ed that even say, you know, we're not saying one specific way is going to be the way. Um, but often they still are working with this sort of idea of you need the, if you do these things or if you learn these things, or if you behave in this way, um, then everything will be good. So for example, if you, um, gather up the right kinds of information. If you make all your decisions according to, um, evidence, meaning like scientific studies, right. Or if you choose a doctor or a hospital that has a low cesarean rate, um, all these things, a lot of methods of childbirth education sort of implicitly promise without maybe even meaning to that. If you do these things, you'll have a good birth. You'll have a good birthing experience and you'll feel good after you've given birth. Hello, it is Ryan. And I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's chumbacasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. we prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Frame. Mother's Day is almost here. What are you getting her? Something that shows you care. Something that makes her feel loved. Something that won't stress you out. Something like the Skylight Frame. The Skylight Frame is the perfect gift. It's a touchscreen photo frame your whole family can upload photos to from wherever they are in the world. It's a way to share with her all the moments that matter. It sets up in seconds. You can even make sure that it's already loaded with photos when your mom opens her Mother's Day gift. And her Skylight Frame can hold thousands of the treasured photos you share. It's an easy, heartfelt way for mom to stay connected with those who matter most. It really is the perfect gift. Now, as a special Mother's Day offer for our listeners, Get 15% off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com slash easy. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E dot com slash easy. Get 15% off your Mother's Day purchase now at skylightframe.com slash easy. Um, so we like to think of this as like giving people recipes, right? Um, so... And everybody has had the experience of like getting, a, or maybe not everybody has, but I certainly have. I've had the recipe of getting a, a re, I've had the experience of getting a recipe from someone. I'm thinking right now of a recipe I got from my mother-in-law and trying to make it. And it just didn't work, you know? Um, and has that ever happened to you? <laughs> yeah, a lot of the time. <laughs> Well, I think for me personally, it's because I tend to deviate from the recipe. I'm like, oh, here's, but wouldn't it be good if I just add a touch of this too? Right. So that could yeah. be my, I take some blame for that. Oh, well, actually, that's a really key point. Um, that's something that can happen, right? So as a childbirth educator, if without really examining what's going on, you just kind of give your client a recipe, like go to evidencebasedbirth.com, ask your doctor these questions give birth at this hospital or choose a midwife or make sure you have a doula, right? We give them this recipe. And then if things don't go, if unwished for events occur, often they'll blame themselves just like you just did. They'll be like, oh, I deviated from what Deb told me because I'm naughty. And that's why I didn't get the birth that I should have. Um, and really blaming themselves is the worst place a parent can be. We almost pr would prefer for them to blame us even though that would create professional problems for us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes they blame the childbirth educator. They blame the doula. They blame the doctor. They blame the hospital. Um, and sometimes there may be a seed of truth in there, 
sometimes one of those people did do something they perhaps shouldn't have done. But the fact remains that um, the real, the root problem is that they've expected that if they use this recipe, things are going to turn out well. Um, and in, and also sort of a meta promise, which is that if you use this recipe, things will turn out in this way, A, and then B, if things turn out in that way, you'll be happy. Whereas Deb, you and I as experienced birth workers have seen plenty of times people have the exact birth that they had said they wanted to have and come out the other end with all kinds of really difficult feelings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, birthing from within works in a slightly different way or thinks about this in a slightly different way. Rather than thinking that we have a recipe (laughs) to give people that if you do these things, then things will be fine, um, we think more in terms of um, allowing people to really look within and look at themselves. What are they drawn towards? What do they want? What are they trying to avoid? What are they afraid of? And to really look at those things and start to develop solution-focused ideas, right? Um, If these things happen, what are ways I might cope? If I have things go on that I didn't expect. How might that, how might that feel for me? Why are these things so important to me? Why has this been so important to me in my life? What have I learned in my life that has taught me that this is important, like being quiet is important or that standing up for myself is the main thing, right? People, we learn these things throughout our lives. And when we go into labor, when we go into that intense space of giving birth, no matter how we're giving birth, whether it's medicated or unmedicated or vaginal cesarean, we go into a different way of moving in the world. Um, You know, we come out of our really sophisticated, high up human brains and we go down into our more primitive brains. And the intensity of the situation will often bring out of us things that we didn't expect or want. Right. Things that break those rules that I just talked about, like rules about being quiet or standing up for yourself um, or taking up people's time or energy. And so what we're wanting in birthing from within is to help people just sort of examine those contracts they've made with themselves and the world before they go into the birthing experience so that they can be ready um, to, to, to watch those things shift and change and ready to cope with the intensity of unexpected or unwished for events or feelings. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I like how I'm going to jump in if you don't mind. I like how one of the exercises that you had us do, you talked about the recipe and the pie and the, the openness of, okay, what else are people trying to avoid? And then actually leaning into that. Can you talk more about that? Um, so I, I think, I I think I can, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, so when we, you know, in her book, one of the most memorable statements that Pam England makes is that, um, worry is the work of pregnancy, right? Meaning that if you have worries or fears, first of all, that's natural. You're going to become a parent, And one of your jobs as a pregnant person, as a parent, is to troubleshoot the whole entire world (laughs) vis-a-vis your child, right? That's one of your jobs. So rather than sort of telling people, don't worry, or be positive, or you don't have to be afraid of that, or here are ways to not be afraid, instead of immediately jumping to what is effectively suppressing those things, even though our our intention is positive, right? We want to be like, feel good. You're going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. That's a positive intention, but it has a suppressive effect, right? If you tell me you're worried about something, Deb, and I just tell you, you know, everything's going to be fine. Don't worry. I mean, maybe it might feel good in the moment, but that what would actually you... probably piss me off. I know, what? I know, if my husband ever tries to like assuage me, be like, no, it's going to be fine. I'm like, no, we need to just, let me just get it out, and it might be okay, it might not. But I've had to. I, I feel invalidated. That, yeah, and it can have that effect. You're absolutely right. It can have that effect with our clients too, right? If they say this is really scary, and we say, well, let's write your fear down on a piece of paper and burn it, right? Have we really? helped them 
aside from just saying, we got to forget that thing. We got to suppress that thing. The idea that we're looking at here is almost using our worries and fears, like, um, like road signs, (laughs) like signposts, like this is what my brain wants to be looking at. Why? What is so, why is this grabbing me? Why is this hooking me like a fish on a hook? Why is this thing grabbing me? Why is this so important to me? Let's look at that. We all understand that's not healthy to sort of get caught in obsessive spins over fear, right? Um, But this is actually a way of being able to step out of that Mm -hmm. um, and use the fear or worry in a productive way that's interesting to us and that can lead to us understanding more about what we need, what we want and need to do in preparation. Um, Whereas just saying like, don't worry, or you don't have to be fearful, or you should feel empowered, or let's burn that fear, right? Just saying that doesn't actually help us step out of that sort of spin cycle. It reminds me of something I said over the weekend that together is that I had that show up as a brand new doula. It was my fifth birth. And this woman had some massive fears that, and I was so new, I didn't even know to ask these. And so I, a year later, she called me in to talk to me about it. I talked to my mentor about it, but it gave me some insight very early on about how these fears, if we don't actually examine them, can come up during labor. And we know what happens when fear starts to take over labor with the adrenaline and stuff. So it's interesting. And maybe that's why I'm so drawn to the birthing within, because one of the things I encourage my my prenatal students and my doula clients is like, let's open that closet, get those skeletons out and see what some of those fears are, whether you want to share it with me or not. But I think if we give some light to it and dust the dust off the skeletons, they also may not feel as scary, but if they do show up, it's not so surprising. And there might be some discussion of if they show up, what steps do we take to help the birthing person get through that? Yeah. Like how can we cope? How can we respond as opposed to just react? Right. Yeah, to those things. It's. I mean, it's really important. Um, and I, you you told that story in the class. Um, mm-hmm. Do you mind if I tell another aspect of that story? Sure. That you, so <laughs> what you told us was that your client said you should take a psychology. <laughs> she class. did. She really <laughs> did. <laughs> and so that. You know, I've been thinking about that, Deb. I'm really glad you said that because it's been lingering in my mind. That's a really good example of a recipe. Your client, from her experience, right, she's still at that point, a year later, it's common to be sort of still stuck inside our experiences and not having fully integrated them, right? And it sounds to me like maybe she was a little bit at that point. And she's thinking, what she's thinking is, if only my doula had taken a psychology class, then things would have been better. And she's telling her friend, she's telling other birth professionals and she's telling her friends, she's sharing this recipe. The recipe to having a better birth is making sure that everyone involved has been educated in psychology 101. This is a recipe, right? And she's trying to avoid happening what happened to her before. And, you know, if you had taken a psychology class, is it um, certain that you could have prevented what happened to her? We both know that the answer is no. That's not Mm -hmm. true. Um, I mean, it's possible. It's possible. But a doula taking us, hiring a doula who took a psychology class is not a guarantee of anything, right? What what we're really talk, talking about there, you know, what, what are we afraid of happening in the birth? Well, we're afraid of our emotions emerging in certain ways. Why are we trying to avoid that? And the answer to that question is going to be different for different people. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. what did that person, when they came face to face with their deepest selves in birth, what did they see? that they didn't like? What is that negative self-belief that they came face to face with? Those are things that we would love to explore a little bit before you have the baby so that they're not just left with that sort of negative self-belief echoing their mind afterwards. And then they're turning turning around and saying, what I needed was a doula who took a psychology class. 
Right. Absolutely. And that's what I love about this system. And I'm really drinking it in is, you know, you guys in, if someone does take a birthing from within CB class that you cover the whole spectrum. It's like one thing I want to make sure people understand if they're listening to this. And I'm trying, I'm, I'm not an affiliate of birthing from within. I'm not getting anything off. I just want to say about that. But I like that it gives the whole picture. So we're going to look at the fears. We're going to lean into some of the discomfort. We're going to find the coping. But also there does need to be some information that people need to have the same language. So I just want people to think if they're looking at this this uh, system or per se, that they're not going to know about the different stages of labor, what a cervix is. Like it, it's it's well-rounded, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know if you read... Uh, I, the 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 Black Mamas Matter Alliances their um, paper on setting the standard for for um, like uh, holistic care for Black women in birth. But um, there's one thing that they say that's really interesting. One of their recommendations is to um, empower people with health literacy. Mm-hmm. They say, and I just love that idea because that's what you really want. You want to give people literacy, like it in these matters. So kind of getting the basic sense of what a cervix is, you know, understanding the stages of labor. Um, but literacy isn't information, right? Literacy is the ability to master and manipulate and be in control of information, right? So yeah, we definitely give people basic information. (laughs) Like this, these are stuff that happen inside your body and labor. These are words that your midwife might say to you and your doctor might say to you, and this is what they mean. And also we are under no illusions that we can provide people with everything they might possibly ever need to know, um, in the birth experience. And we're under no illusion that people are going to remember everything we say. And therefore beyond just providing like info, we want to make sure we provide literacy so that people feel, um, able, you know, to move out of this sort of childlike, please teacher, tell me the answer to move out of that and to go out and find the answer, you know? So it's, you're absolutely right. It's, it's really well-rounded in that sense. We give info, but we also give the wherewithal to find info on your own. And then, and also we give the internal sort through like what your mind and your heart do with info and have been doing with info for your entire life. Yeah, I actually brought up in yesterday's class I, that I taught about the birth history. And that's actually one of the uh, essays I have my teacher trainees write because that has a lot of impact on how we perceive birth and then how we even talk about it. Uh, and especially for teachers that are going to teach the pregnant student, you know, what what biases are they bringing into? So I gave a little homework assignment to my students, just my regular prenatal students of what, what has been the birth history that your family has told you? You know, I had one student speak up saying that her two sisters and her mom all had C-sections. So even though she was, she's uh, hoping to have a vaginal birth in her mind, she's still, and she sat with it. She goes, you know, I didn't realize, but in my mind, I'm still, even though I'm saying I'm hoping I have a vaginal birth, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a cesarean. And she, she kind of let that come to light that that's actually what was living in her heart because that's all she heard from her family. So I asked them to look a little bit deeper and I'm, I told them, let's chat about it next week. So I'm curious what comes up, but I like that you guys also dipped into that as well in the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, I mean, it's so cool that you're doing that with the people you're working with. Um, well, I had been. And so that's why I'm so like, oh, wow, I'm already doing some of these things. Maybe that's why it just speaks to me so much. Yeah. And then, you know, with a story like that, um, a further question is like, what is the story? What is the meaning of that for you? Like, what is the what does it mean about you that you are bound to have a cesarean? Because like, that's going to mean different things to different people. Right. Like attach different meanings to that. And that gets really interesting too. You know what? So what, what are you in your deepest heart of hearts? What does that say about you as a woman, as a parent? What does that say about you as a yoga teacher? <laughs> you yeah. know, like we, we have deep contracts with what these meanings are. Um, and they're not, At first glance, they might seem like really rational and obvious, but the closer we look at it, often it's kind of random. You know, why would that mean that? You know, Um, so it's, 
it's like you said, I think you said bringing it out into the light. Mm -hmm. If you turn the light on, you can't look at what you're stepping on. Mm -hmm. And that's just all there is to it. (laughs) All right. So another thing we did over the weekend was talking about the labyrinth. So can you talk a little bit, what is a labyrinth? (laughs) How is it used in birthing within? And then I'm going to throw one more question. So it's kind of a three part to one question about the labyrinth. What was really interesting is that we, you had us draw the labyrinth. We talked about going in, but then you also talked about the importance of coming out. So I'm going to throw all that on your plate right now. Yeah. So the labyrinth is one of birthing from within sort of signatures, let's call it. It's like a signature element. Um, it's one of our signature metaphors, one of our signature understandings. Um, just to sort of give some background, um, I know it's different in different languages, but in English, um, there's a technical difference in the definition of the word labyrinth versus the word maze. Oh, um, yeah. So a maze, um, you can make wrong choices you can get lost and you can encounter dead ends. Whereas a labyrinth, you cannot. If you keep going in a labyrinth, you will go all the way in. And then there's only one way to come back out again, which is to turn around. And if you keep going after having turned around, you will come all the way out. In other words, there's only one way in and only one way out. Thus, if you keep going, you will make it through the labyrinth. Um, and I invite people right now to do, <laughs> as you listen, if you can, to do a little Google image search of labyrinth or um, the exact labyrinth that we usually work with in Birthing from Within is called a seven circuit labyrinth. Um, if you count the circuits of the one that you drew, Deb, this weekend, you will see that it, there are seven circuits. So, And that way, um, folks who are listening, you'll be able to see what I mean. So this is one of our central um symbols that we use in birthing from within. We think of it, we talk a lot in birthing from within about the idea of maps, like a map of getting through the experience, the rite of passage that is birth, um, the, a map to get through the sort of transformative ordeal. Um, you know, when we talk about medical stuff, that's like more of a maze, right? Like, will you be offered an induction or not? If you're offered an induction, What's the right answer to make? If this happens, we could make these two decisions. What do we do, right? There are all these branching paths and you don't even know which part of that maze you'll end up in, right? Like if you're having, if you're planning a home birth, for example, it's possible that you might end up in the hospital. That happens sometimes, right? And if so, like your web of like medical choices is going to look different than if you hadn't been in a hospital, Mm -hmm. right? So that's really tricky. That's not a very helpful map, the medical map. Um, The labyrinth applies to any kind of birth. You cross the threshold into the unknown and you keep going. And in the seven circuit labyrinth and in many labyrinths, because of the way sort of geometrically it has to be put together often as you make your way in, it will feel like you're moving back out again. And often you get really disoriented, even if you're the one that drew the labyrinth and you're looking right at it as you're tracing with it with your finger. I know that you can confirm this, Deb. It can be a little disorienting. Yeah. You start thinking, where am I really going in? Am I going the right way? Am I doing this right? And then if you're doing it in a room with other people, then am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? What did the instructor say again? Is this is what I'm, is this what I'm supposed to be thinking? Is this what I'm supposed to be experiencing? All of those questions that I just asked are questions that we ask ourselves in the process of giving birth. Again, no matter how we're giving birth, right? Mm -hmm. Is this fast? Is this too slow? Is this the right thing? Is something, did something wrong happen? Is there a problem? Am I feeling the way I'm supposed to be feeling? Am I getting out of this activity? (laughs) The thing that I was supposed to be getting out of it? These are all questions that we ask ourselves, right? As we go through the labor process or the birth process. Um, So the labyrinth really speaks to that, that internal map of the experience of transformation that is birth. 
Um, and those, we call them gates, those gates of self doubt, those gates of questioning or fear that we go through as we go through the labor process. And the labyrinth can give us a map to navigating again, any kind of birth, any kind of birth, right? Which is different from other maps. Like if I teach you about, um, What's a good example? Um, well, oh, what if I teach you about, you know, uh, IV versus HEPLOC in the hospital, right? Which is standard at your hospital, which choice might be a good choice to make. Um, I can teach you about that, but that's not, not going to provide you for like a particularly good map if you're having a home birth. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's not going to provide you with a particularly good map if your baby is in a big hurry and comes out in the cab right? It's not that it's not interesting or valuable information. It's just that it it doesn't provide a map of what's going to happen, right? Whereas the labyrinth provides a map of what is going to happen no matter what happens. And that's so cool. It's so cool. Yeah. I really enjoyed that activity. And I really liked the idea. There was one gate you talked about and I didn't realize I even blurted it out. I'm like, that's transition. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Would you remember what that was? Yeah, the gate of holy terror. <laughs> yes. yes. And I'm like, and that's transition. Yeah. I mean, as a doula, this is my own, this is my very personal take on it. As a doula, I feel that um, transition isn't necessarily directly related to the gate of holy terror in the sense that I see people go through the gate of holy terror all the time that never make it to transition. Mm-hmm you know, who get an epidural before transition or who have a cesarean before transition. So whether or not you actually experience transition or whether or not for you transition ends up being the gate of holy terror, we almost always cross through that gate of holy terror in the birth process, right? Where it's just this mind bending moment that might be due to physical intensity is often due to physical intensity and, but often, but also, sorry, it can be due to other things. Um, just this mind bending intensity where just sort of all of the rules, uh, that you understood about yourself and the universe and your, your body and just kind of blow apart sometimes like in slow motion before you eyes, you know, it's, and you can't I did think. A, I did a you podcast with a Rhea Dempsey, <laughs> Rhea Dempsey, um, And she called that the crisis of confidence, and it can happen at any time in any part of labor. And that's also ringing true about what you were talking about. Yeah. And we also talk about the gate of self-doubt, those moments where people are like, "Can can I do this? And we hear all the time, it's really normal um, for people to say, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Labor, I can't do this. And it's not just... um, that's not just in our specific culture. I read, I don't know if you know the books, um, My Struggle by Knausgaard. Um, but he, uh, he's in, oh gosh, he's in Scandinavia. I can't remember which country right now um, he was in when his wife gave birth. And But he, they're not American. And she gave birth at a birth center, you know, with a midwife and gas and air. So not like the standard American medical setting. And he reports her saying the same thing at a certain point. I can't do this. Like these gates of really profound self-doubt that we move through. And something that, a shift in understanding that I think is helpful, right, by just saying this is a gate on the path normalizes it. It's not a problem to be solved. We don't have to make you think you can do it. We don't have to avoid you thinking that you can't do it. We simply open that gate and walk through it. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> like and it's interesting. So many different methods have different names for it. Like I, one thing that I always call it, like turning the corner. Those, which is why when you had us draw something, uh, our image of one of the stories, I had all these waves and corners because that's how I always, when as a doula, when I would witness these shifts or these gates in my mind, we were turning the corner. We were on one path, we were doing okay, and we turned the corner, and now we're on a different part of that same experience. And then another emotional signpost, and we turn her in a corner. So uh, it's interesting. We're all kind of talking about the same thing with a little slightly different language. Yeah. And metaphors are really powerful and like choosing our metaphors, um, you know, because turning the corner is also a metaphor, right? Choosing our metaphors really thoughtfully with, um, an eye to what 
What are, what are they implying, right? What meanings are inside this word? That's something that birthing for within pays a lot of attention to. Attention to. In fact, um, on the blog, I I, I wrote a post. Um, so we have I have a series called Birthing from Within Dictionary that talks about sort of specific words that we use in birthing from within that in very specific ways and that are important to our practice. And, um, the first one I did was on the word mentor, but the second one was on the word gates and why we use the word gates to talk about that and why it seems so fitting for us. So Mm -hmm. it's fun. It's fun to explore ideas like that. Like what is a good metaphor to use right now for this? And, um, that's something that we, we do as you know, professionals, we think about our own practice, like what metaphor can I use to talk to parents about this? And also it's something that we might help parents grow in themselves, mm-hmm. you know, me- thinking about their own experiences metaphorically um, so that they can sort of understand them in different ways so that they can, you know, look at it through a different lens or turn the kaleidoscope in another way. Yeah. Okay. I want to throw us back to the importance of coming out the journey out of the labyrinth. Cause so, you know, if we're talking about the labyrinth as the birth, you know, the baby's head and then there's a whole labyrinth out. And I feel like the postpartum period's kind of brushed aside, like, oh yay, the baby's out, but there's still a lot to <laughs> go through and explore. Yeah, there is. Um so one way that you can understand the labyrinth, one way that you could understand it is that the journey into the center is the labor and the center marks the birth of the baby. And then the journey out is that postpartum journey. And the postpartum journey is, I think, much longer than we realize, especially when we think in terms of psychological integration. I think the postpartum journey, for most people who have kids who are completely out of the baby phase, let's say for most people who have kids in, say, like upper elementary school, Right. If you ask them to look back on like how long really did it take you to sort of integrate the birth experience, et cetera, I think they would say probably two to three years. Right. Till the child was two or three years old, you're very meaningfully in this sort of postpartum state. Um, So to help people, the labyrinth is useful to help people understand that because this is such a weird thing. It's an amazing sort of trick of the labyrinth is that once you've gone all the way in, Going out is still not particularly easy. You still experience the same sense of disorientation. And just like as you're on your way in, sometimes it feels like you're going out again. The path on the way out works the same way. Sometimes you feel like you're circling back in again. And, you know, we all know that happens postpartum. Mm -hmm, Like mm -hmm. I thought I was doing okay, but now it seems like everything's crazy again. Right. And sometimes we talk about this idea of you pass back through those gates again, you know, that gate of holy terror, you know, sometime in the first few days or weeks with your baby, when you're like, what the heck is even happening? Who am I? And what is life? You know, like we have that. Um, And so in those gates of self-doubt, the gates of fear, um, we pass through those on the way out. Um, And often also, as we move out of the labyrinth, we're looking back on our way in. You know, people take a long time to really look at their birth stories. And birth stories tend to change and evolve as we move. And sometimes a birth story will get stuck at a certain gate. Um, and that can cause a lot of suffering. And we all know someone whose birth story got stuck, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Who really hasn't, in terms of their understanding of their birth, they really haven't fully exited the labyrinth. They're really still in there. Um, and they're telling their birth in terms of like really, and then the doctor did this to me. And then this happened really sort of concrete minutia sometimes And you'll hear stories like this 5, 10, 15, even 20 years out from birth, right, Um, where the story, the details haven't been fully integrated into the person, and they're kind of stuck um, in these sort of negative self-stories about what happened. Um, And at times like that, um, Birthing from Within also has a, a program called Birth Story Listening that helps professionals figure out how to work with people who are sort of stuck in their 
so that they can find their way out of the labyrinth again into um, a new, more complete self. I think that's so valuable. I think that's really important because I feel like sometimes unknowingly and meaning meaning well people invalidate maybe they're on maybe the listener is uncomfortable so they'll focus on like oh but you and baby are fine and that's invalidating or mm-hmm. again they kind of just uh pivot it to like oh yes but you know kind of just the going to the now instead of letting or or they let the person just marinate in the discomfort over and over so i like that i'm i'm attracted to that idea of the birth story listener and how that can help and hold the space and maybe help someone get unstuck. Yeah. It's a really important skill for, especially, you know, like doulas, not even postpartum doulas, but, you know, birth doulas at that postpartum meeting. Um, it can be really hard for us to work with clients who had a difficult birth experience, you know, that we witnessed. I remember so clearly once really early in my doula career, someone this was one of these people who had the exact birth that she had said she wanted, but was kind of shattered by the experience, but just by the intensity of the experience, mm-hmm. you know, birth is really intense. And you know, her big problem at the time is that she didn't feel as though she had been brave. Like her one forbidden thing, you know, was to feel scared and to not feel joyful. And she, in birth, she did not feel joyful. She felt frightened which we know is normal, but that was really a traumatic feeling for her because she had a lot of contracts and agreements in her life about, you know, being joyful, like birth is, is joyful and fear is bad, you know? Um, and so she said to me at the, I remember this so clearly, she said, I don't feel like I was brave. And I said to her, because I was a new doula and I didn't understand these things. And I said, oh, you were so brave. You were so brave. If you could go back now, what would you say to her? You know, I think one of the really important things, just, you know, speaking at a really basic level, is to validate them. Be like, yeah, it was important to you to feel brave. And you didn't. That's It's really hard for you to remember that. Mm -hmm. I like that. It's happening, you know. And then, you know, if you have a good connection, just starting with, that validation, you might not even, you know, a lot of birthing from within about being a mentor is not thinking that you know what's going to happen, right? It's just kind of cultivating curiosity. So you might start there and a whole conversation might come out of that, you know? Um, and I'm going to tell you something. I don't think I've ever told anyone this before, <laughs> but <laughs> well, why not say it in the podcast? <laughs> yeah, one of um, my birth. I actually, I only, this is so funny, Deb. I only just remembered this yesterday, but I also was concerned that I hadn't been brave when I had my first child. And I remember saying that to my midwife and she, from a place of wonderful, positive intention, I love her and she's lovely. She had such a positive intention. She said to me, you don't have to be brave. And that really hurt me because I felt like she was saying, oh yeah, you're right. You weren't brave, but it's okay. (laughs) And you know, you're so open that I was like maybe two weeks postpartum. You're so open at that time that every single word that people say, like drop into you like a hot knife through butter, you know? Mm -hmm. And those words just really dropped into me. You don't have to be brave. Like she's saying I wasn't brave. And she's saying that like, you know, it's not even important. And I wasn't angry or hurt per se, but it, it really like, it stopped my heart a little bit. And it wasn't what it, she was trying to give me medicine. Mm-hmm. But it, it it didn't it didn't help me heal that split. You know that that was hard for me to hear. That's incredible that that just came up, and thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. So that's I mean, those are two different conversations around the same topic, right? That's an example of something that can happen to someone in labor. Like I didn't feel brave, and for me, that was the worst thing, right? That was the one forbidden thing was to not be brave. And I wasn't. And, you know, both I as a new doula and my midwife, who was very experienced, had really positive intentions in how we responded to that. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yes, you were brave. And she said to me, listen, you don't have to be brave. Those came from like deep wells of compassion in our souls. But it really missed the mark, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. the mark both times. 
So I want to talk a little, I, I'm just loving this work and I feel like there's a lot, of, so people can dip, you know pick up the book and some people might have a mentor in their area, but if someone's starting to get into this work, what can they do on their own if they don't have a mentor to help them and work with them and assist and guide them? Yeah, that's a great question. And the, the baseline of that question, what underlies that question is the understanding that birthing from within mentors are pretty thin on the ground compared to like Lamaze or other, it's, it's sometimes you may be in a community where you can't find someone that mm-hmm. does happen. Um, and we're trying to address that by sort of bumping up our training. But with that, um, having said that, there's a couple things. One, one thing that I want to mention is that the mo- Pam England's most recent book is Ancient Map for Modern Birth. And that's really the book that I would urge people to pick up. Birthing from Within is her first book. Um, and Ancient Map for Modern Birth is kind of an update of this with more uh, with modern understandings of current issues in the birth world, including like the skyrocketing induction rate. And also with sort of more, you know, you know how it is. The older you get, the more time passes, the more you flesh out your ideas. Mm-hmm. It was with more fleshed out, more careful consideration of all of her ideas. So that's the book that I would pick up. That's number one. Um, number two, um, the book has a lot of ideas and exercises in it. And if you can commit to really doing those, just on your own, little birth art exercises, little journaling exercises, breathing exercises, mindfulness exercises, I think that has a lot of value. I mean, that's why it's there. That's why the book is there. That's why it's in the book to reach people who don't have access to someone like you or like me who have trained in this model. Um, So pick up the book and actually do the stuff in it. And then finally, another thing that I would say is many, I might even say most, I could be wrong, but many birthing from within mentors are willing to work on the phone or on Skype or on Zoom remotely. And that's totally possible. That's doable. A lot of this work can be done remotely, especially like if you can use, um, if you can see each other, mm-hmm. like on with the camera on zoom, um, it can be done. So go to birthing from within.com and go to the place that says for parents and find a mentor in your area and just look through the people and see if there's someone who stands out to you and reach out to them and ask if they'll, they're interested in doing a phone or Skype session with you. Um, and I'm betting, um, most of them are going to be open to that. I certainly am. That's exciting. I have to admit, I'm I'm kind of loving jumping into this world. I'm really excited. And it's good. Like I've been doing birth work and I've been, it's such a joy to me for, let me see, almost, I started the studio 17 years ago and I jumped into the doula world pretty soon after that. And when, the main reason I jumped into the weekend workshop is because I teach so much. I wanted to get re-inspired. Um, I'm always reading um, whatever birth working I can find, but I wanted to live through a new experience. And now I feel like a person like, Oh, I'm just going to do the month long online. Now I'm like, I might jump full into it. (laughs) It's exciting. So I'm really, I'm loving this. All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I'm going to ask you for one piece of advice or tip you want to offer new and expectant parents. Shopify helps you sell at every stage of your business. Like that, let's put it online and see what happens stage. And the site is live. That we opened a store and need a fast checkout stage. Thanks, you're all set. That count it up and ship it around the globe stage. This one's going to Thailand. And that, wait, did we just hit a million orders stage? Whatever your stage, businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 a month trial at shopify.com slash listen. And we're back. All right. So (laughs) what is your one piece of advice or tip you'd like to offer a new and expectant parents? I think it's so important to understand that sometime in the birth experience, you are going to encounter the deeply unexpected. Something that just comes out completely from left field, both practically and emotionally. Um, And it's so important to spend time in your preparation to think about, you know, what that means for you and how you're going to cope for the unexpected. And maybe going back to this idea of worry is the work of pregnancy and to use your fears like signposts, if there are unwished for events that you are specifically um, 
really trying to avoid to dig just a little bit into that. Like, why am I trying to avoid that? What is the problem there for me? If it were to happen, what's one thing I could do to, um, to cope? What's one piece of support that I could use from my partner? Um, so to really, um, open your mind to the idea that anything can happen. You don't have to like be happy with that. You don't have to give up all preferences. Of course you have preferences. And of course, take the steps that are going to increase the likelihood that your preferences will come to pass. Absolutely. And also look at the idea of the things that you don't pre- don't prefer. Look at the idea of the unexpected and spend some time examining what you're going to do to cope with that. I love it. I love it. And I think that might be next week's homework assignment for my students. <laughs> Take a look at the, the things you don't want. <laughs> and where can people find your work? So my personal website is birthing from within New York, all spelled out birthing from within New York.com. Um, and there's also an, a ton of amazing information for people who just want to kind of like get an idea of how we think and what we do on the birthing from within blog, which can be found at birthing from within.com. And then you just click blog. There's so much there. It's like, it's a, it's an incredible resource for people who are not in the organization. It's totally open to the public. So go take a look. And I, as I was digging around on that website and prep for our conversation, the uh, podcast I did with Pam England's on there. Yes, it is. I, yes. I read the title. I'm like, oh, that sounds good. I want to listen to it. And I'm like, oh, that's my. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Clearly, I was attracted to my own work. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for all your time and this really deep, deep work and knowledge. I'll make sure I have links to the Birthing From Within blog and the website and your website all in the show notes. And I'm actually going to order, as soon as we get off the phone, I'm going to order Pam's new book. I haven't read it. I heard her talk about it when I interviewed her. And I might make a shift if it speaks to me in the way that you're talking about it. I might change some of my curriculum for my teacher training and switch that book out. I'm excited about this. Yeah, we can talk about it. I'm so happy to to, uh, walk with you down this path. Yeah, maybe we'll do a follow-up podcast about that book too. Who knows? (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you for your time. Have a good morning. Bye. All right. Take care, Deb. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. With Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.